1937, the year The Hobbit was published, John Ronald Rule Tolkien stood at the crossroads of his life. It was creatively the crucial juncture. He was 45 years old and a father of four children. For over a decade, he had held the distinguished chair of Rawlinson and Bosworth, professor of Anglo-Saxon language at Oxford. He had conscientiously attended to his academic duties, always giving a full schedule of lectures and participating amply, if not always enthusiastically, in the many dreary administrative tasks of university life. And Tolkien was at this time well recognized as a brilliant scholar. A fact widely uh, and readily acknowledged by his fellows. But despite his evident talents, he had published relatively little for a man of his position and stature. And of course, then, as now, a professor at Oxford was expected to do research and publish. Of course, many scholarly projects sat in Tolkien's office in various stages of conception or commitment prolonged procrastination, and various states of final incompletion, at least incompletion by Tolkien's perfectionist standards. The tendency to procrastinate was really becoming part of Tolkien's Oxford reputation. But as some of his academic colleagues had undoubtedly begun to wonder, and as Tolkien himself humbly surmised, some were asking, exactly what it was that he had been doing during the decade and more of his professorial tenure. Well, part of the explanation is easily provided. Despite the prestige of his position, a don at Oxford did not make much money. And Tolkien had a growing family, and he was constantly under financial pressure of providing for them. And so he had to take extra work, usually working as a, a contract examiner for other schools a time-consuming, tedious task that he hated and which in turn really only paid him an additional pittance. But there was, of course, another explanation. Something apart from the scholarly world was absorbing Tolkien's attention. And this was his imaginative exploration of the land of fairy. It was a consuming task to which he returned at every opportunity. A public revelation of his secret occupation finally arrived with the publication in 1937 of a delightful juvenile novel about a wizard and a dragon and dwarves and the adventures of one Mr. Bilbo Baggins, himself a hobbit. The response of his university colleagues Tolkien summarized in a letter to his publisher shortly after The Hobbit's release. I think Oxford interest is mildly aroused. I am constantly asked how my Hobbit is. The attitude is, as I foresaw, not unmixed with surprise and a little pity. My college is, I think, good for purchase of about six copies, if only in order to find material for teasing me. But of course, publication of The Hobbit was just a hint, perhaps an embarrassingly small hint of the sum of what Tolkien had been doing during these many years. When The Hobbit was published in 1937, for over two decades, Tolkien had been privately answering a summons into an imaginative world and experience that really has very few analogs in modern history. During these decades, exploration of this imaginative world was the central task of his heart, the duty of deepest concern and the work to which he returned whenever possible. The hours he gave to this undertaking, and they were many, he confessed were, quote, stolen, often guiltily, from time already mortgaged, mortgaged to the outward duties of life, both professionally and socially. In the first lecture of this series, we discuss the initiation of Tolkien's imaginative journey. Around 1914, while a student at Oxford, Tolkien began exploring an unusual imaginative domain 
he called fairy. His creative excursion started with the invention of a new language. But as the language evolved in depth and in complexity, he discovered his linguistic meditations were opening upon a very strange panorama. The invented languages were not just his invention, but became, as he experienced them, native tongues of the elves. And he discovered elves had many stories to tell. Their languages came replete with tales, with myths, with poetry. They came also with visual images to Tolkien. And Tolkien expressed these in his drawings, which, some of which we displayed last week, paintings done during this period. On the threshold of the Great War, as a junior officer on the front lines of battle in one of the most horrendous conflicts of the First War, the Battle of the Somme, and then in convalescence in hospital for over a year afterwards, Tolkien turned to recording the languages, the history, the legends of the elves that were obtruding into his consciousness. Of these stories, he explained in later years, they arose in my mind as given things. And as they came separately, so too the links grew, an absorbing though continually interrupted labor. Yet always I had the sense of recording what was already there somewhere, not of inventing. These initial fantasies were written in several journals collectively titled The Book of Lost Tales. And these were the foundation of all of his subsequent creative writing. Much later, they became the legends of the first age of Middle Earth and an important background atmosphere to all that followed in the third age. The third age recorded, of course, in the Lord of the Rings. It must be remembered, however, that at this time, this was an entirely private effort. Only once did he share a portion of these writings publicly, reading the story of the fall of Gondolin to a small Oxford club around 1920. But in the early 20s, the construction of the lost book, the initial conception of tales, was abandoned before ever reaching any final form. Just unfortunately, as Tolkien would over ensuing years abandon so many efforts to put literary form to his vision, he sensed he had not found in prose the structure needed he was seeking the proper format for expression of the myth he had received as a gift, as a given. But of course, this was not the end. In fact, it was really only just the beginning. Over the next 15 years, he worked continuously to find forms suitable to expression of his imaginative experience of the land of fairy. The tales he first heard between 1915 and early 1920, he continually reimagined continually with new depth and different annoyances. New elements, new tales were discovered in the process. They went through layer upon layer of expression. He worked them in prose and in poetic form, complex metered rhyme, alliterative verse. And during this period from the 1920s into the mid-1930s, the elven languages also underwent much further development and enrichment. As he worked in word, so too he worked in image. And he illustrated and painted many of the images that were coming to him in his exploration of the elven lands, of the ancient world of Middle Earth. Now, although this myth, it is often emphasized in works about Tolkien, underwent considerable growth and development and alteration from the first conceptions that came to him around the time of and shortly after the Great War, there was a core structure of Tolkien's myth, his earliest mythological conception that really did not change. His initial cosmogonic myth, the music of the Ainur, retained its original form throughout Tolkien's creative development. And the story of the two trees of light and the elven gems made from that light, the Silmaril, stood as a focal point to his entire mythic conception. Okay, I was going through some of these points, some of the things I 
reviewed there with a few friends at a Christmas party. And I'd had a couple cups of champagne and I was babbling on about Tolkien, about his creative vision, about the elfin languages, the stories coming as givens. And one of the ladies I was talking with looked at me and said, well, okay, so excuse me, but what, what you're saying, what, you're, what you mean here is that, well, Tolkien was a bit off. I mean, he was crazy. Um, you're saying he believed in elves? I thought a minute, and I answered, no, and no. Tolkien didn't believe in elves. Believe in elves? Tolkien didn't believe in elves. Tolkien knew elves. He knew the elves by hundreds of names. He knew their genealogies, their history, their mythology. He knew their sorrows, their art, their joy, and he spoke their languages, and they were many. Tolkien did not believe in elves. And to the second point, was he crazy? No. Now I confess, placing the first response in conjunction with the second response is a challenge one faces in our current world. How could a person who knew elves not be crazy? There are many definitions of crazy. And as a physician, I must say that for many decades, I've dealt with just about every form of craziness imaginable in this world. And by none of those common definitions was John Ronald Rule Tolkien crazy. Unusual? Yes. Maybe a bit eccentric? Yes. And on top of all of that, the man was caught in the most unusual of human experiences. The most unusual of human experiences. He himself intimated in, in, in subsequent years of life that he thought perhaps only once in a generation did a person encounter the experience he had endured. To understand Tolkien, we really have to take a little bit of a look at his worldview. I'm sure that the man himself, caught in his very unusual experience, at some point or another asked himself if he was crazy. And certainly he searched for analogs of his experience elsewhere in human creative history. To understand he, how he might have understood himself, we really have to see a bit about his worldview. You know, we live in a, in a materialistic, secular world. I refer to it as the flatlands. Within our world, there is only one dimension material, logical, rational, or irrational, one. The general worldview of our time has removed the possibility of an intersecting, transcendent, otherness touching this realm. This, of course, was not always the case, but it is now the case of our time. Tolkien was not part of that materialistic, secular world. He was a religious man, that's true. He was a Roman Catholic all of his life. But you can't just put the man in a box and put a label on it, Roman Catholic, and put him on the shelf. It doesn't work. Tolkien's religion was for him a lived experience, an experience of otherness. Yes, he did go to Mass and confession before Mass, many if not most days of his adult life. In the Eucharistic ritual, in the consumption of the consecrated host, he took a deep inner meaning and solace. He felt something that meant something to him in those rituals. But his religion was not confined by dogma, by teaching. In his perception, there was a thing called truth. Truth. There was a story that was true. Both beyond and within, and both before and after this world. 
There was a story before cosmos, before world, before time. Story had created, infused, and formed what we call history. It's a strange view, you see, because we think of stories as things we derive from history. Stories are created from the events of human time. Myths are, in many people's views, reconstruction of human in-time perception of cosmic events or retellings of hero stories. For Tolkien, story came before history. Cosmogenesis was an expression of a story conceived within the mystery of divinity. The divine had told the story, and cosmos was the result. You'll remember his story of the music of the Ainur, a Luvatar calling forth the first singing voices that sang creation. Human mind or consciousness in active imaginative perception of story actually participated in the effoliation of creation. And effoliation is a word he invented in the flowering forth, the leafing forth of the potential of creation. It's an unusual view. Perhaps I can express it a little bit more by talking a little bit about how Tolkien attempted to express it to his good friend, C.S. Lewis. Now, throughout his life, Tolkien really dealt with his experience. First of all, he had to understand it himself. He also felt a need to attempt to express the nature of his experience to others. But most importantly, creatively, he had to reveal it, reveal its product, its art, its creation. C.S. Lewis was a, a young man of 26 when he arrived in Oxford, around 1926, as a tutor at Magdalen College. Tolkien was seven years his senior. They were a bit suspicious of each other at first. Lewis commented at one point that as a young man growing up in Ulster, he implicitly learned never to trust a Roman Catholic. <laughs> and upon his entry into the uh, School of Literature at Oxford, he was taught explicitly never to trust a philologist. And of course, <laughs> Tolkien was both. But as they came to know each other, the prejudices did fall. Tolkien found in Lewis an amazing intellect, an open heart, and an honesty that appealed to him greatly. And Lewis found much the same in Tolkien. Lewis, at this point in his young life, in his late 20s, had been struggling with his own journey towards religion. He had started as what might be called a secular humanist, agnostic. He was searching for joy, and he identified this with his journey towards divinity. By the time Tolkien and Lewis got together, Lewis had come to the conclusion that indeed there was a divinity. But he could make no sense of the Christian myth. He could make no sense of how a story about a sacrifice thousands of years ago in any fashion affected his life in the present. Tolkien struggled to explain his own view of story his own view of myth, myths that were true. One night, around 1930, 1931, they sat all evening, and then through the early morning hours until dawn, arguing these very subjects. And Tolkien said some things that night about the reality, the truth of myth, that transformed Lewis's religious understanding and actually led him on the road to his eventual Christian conversion. After he went home, Tolkien tried to summarize them in a poem, which he wrote, dedicating it to Jack, his friend, C.S. Lewis. He called it mythopoeia, which in Greek means the genesis of myth, or the creation of myth. To one who said myths were lies, and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver tongues. And this indeed had been Lewis's approach to mythology. And then the dedication, Philomythus to Miso, 
philomythos, lover of myth, to misomythos, hater of myth. And I abbreviate the poem here in slight editing. He said to Lewis, you look at trees and label them just so, for trees are trees, and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace one of the many minor globes of space, a star is a star, some matter in a ball, compelled to course mathematically amid the regimented cold inane where distant atoms are each moment slain. Yet trees are not trees until so named and seen, and never were so named till those had been whose speeches involuted breath unfurled faint echo and dim picture of the world. Free captives, undermining shadowy bars, digging the foreknowledge from experience and panning the vein of spirit out of sense. Great powers they slowly brought out of themselves and looking backwards, they beheld the elves that wrought on cunning forges in the mind and light and dark on secret looms entwined. He sees no star who does not see them first of living silver made that sudden burst to flame like flowers beneath the ancient song, whose very echo after music long has since pursued. There is no firmament, only a void, unless a jeweled tent, myth-woven and elf-patterned, and no earth, unless the mother's womb, whence all have birth. The heart of man is not compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise, and still recalls him. Though now long estranged, man is not wholly lost, nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet he is not dethroned and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned. His world dominion by creative act, not his to worship the great artifact. Not his to worship the great artifact. What was that artifact? The primary world of our common consensus reality. This is where we placed our attentions. But man was created, in Tolkien's view, in image of a creator, and had by birthright right to create, to further create, to enrich the world of consciousness through story. Man, sub-creator, the refracted light, through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues, and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world we fill with elves and goblins, though we dare to build gods and their houses out of dark and light, and sow the seeds of dragons, t'was our right, used or misused. The right has not decayed, we make still by the law in which we're made. And of course, Tolkien also struggled to understand himself in the terms of other people's experience. His experience had been unusual. He understood it as a reflection of a divine power within him that allowed him to move from the common reality into an imaginative realm and find it. But who else had shared such an experience? He didn't see it manifest very commonly or evidently at all among most of his modern fellows. Perhaps the best evidence Tolkien found that he was not alone in his experience came from the ancient texts that were both his early love and the later center of his academic study. The stories of mythology of the early northern peoples, 
the Finnish Kalevala, the Norse Elder Ada, and perhaps most importantly, Beowulf, the epic poem authored by his own Anglo-Saxon progenitors. Tolkien had an ear that heard music in the form and flow of language. And these languages of the northern people struck his ear most kindly. But the old languages did not come naked. They came vested about with story. And where had that story come from? It had come from the voice of the creator, an imaginative voice, from the voice of the ancient bards. These old stories were meant for oral recitation, placed in verse and song. The ancient bards, it seemed to Tolkien, had crossed the imaginative boundaries that he himself had crossed and ventured into a mythic fact revealed to them by their vision. He saw in them, these creators of the ancient myths, these recorders of the ancient myth, a reflection of the experience he felt that he was sharing. The authors, of course, had lived in a different time, a very different time, an epic when imaginal was not constrained as simply delusional. The unseen remained for these ancient voices, real, and the chance of the intersection between the unseen and the seen was accepted as a valid human experience in that ancient time, but certainly not in Tolkien's own. Tom Shippey is one of the most interesting of, of modern Tolkien scholars. In footnote, Shippey is a professor of philology. When Shippey was a young graduate student, he knew Tolkien in Oxford at the end of Tolkien's life and went on to occupy the chair of philology in Leeds that Tolkien had first occupied earliest in his career. Shippey has a, a very interesting perspective upon Tolkien simply because of his shared interest and knowledge of the philological background from which Tolkien worked. And Shippey has suggested in an essay published oh, probably 15, 20 years ago now that Tolkien had an extreme sympathy, brotherhood with the voice of the creator of Beowulf. And in his essay, he even suggests that Tolkien might have thought himself to be a reincarnation of the Beowulf poet. Because you see in, in Tolkien's mythology, elves, well, elves do reincarnate. They may be killed, but they do not die. They come back. I don't accept that view because I think it foreign to Tolkien's manner of thinking. But Tolkien did sense that something that was present in the Beowulf poet was reborn in his own experience. The ability to see, to see the unseen. In 1936, Tolkien was asked to address the British Academy of Arts on the subject of Beowulf. And the Beowulf poet was the, the center of, uh, of many of his professional studies. He gave an exceptional lecture. I said earlier that Tolkien had not published a great deal, and that's true. He really did not publish a great deal academically. To that should be added the fact that what he did publish, much of it has become classic in its field. And this essay was one. At this time, many people read the Beowulf myth, the Beowulf story. An Anglo-Saxon, old English text, authored sometime between the 6th and 10th century in modern opinion, a text of which only one copy survived into modern times. Many people attempted to read Beowulf as, uh, well, a sociological document. It was to be dissected and so we could better understand Anglo-Saxon feudal society. In his essay, Tolkien said, look, people take Beowulf. They see a tower constructed there. And they tear it down, trying to look at the little pieces of stone to find out where they came from, to see if there's any information that might be gained from closer examination of the minute. But what they fail to see is the poet, the creator of Beowulf, had constructed a tower. Certainly the story he had constructed had elements in it, building blocks taken from a much more ancient time. But the tower was constructed. And the important point was that from the top of that tower, the poet 
could see the sea. The poet could see the sea. And of course, that image of the sea was an important one to Tolkien. It was his image of the great western land beyond the known. The Beowulf poet had expressed to Tolkien that imaginative spirit. And he brought his own personal understanding, his own personal imaginative experience into his scholarship and into his understanding of these old authors. When he gave an essay, a speech becoming an essay, on translating Gwain, another medieval text to which he gave a primary translation. He said, you know, the thing that interests me in this text is not where the stories came from or what ancient elements may be present in the material worked by the Gwain poet. What he was interested in, as he says, was the movement of the poet's mind, his creative experience. In the 1950s, or actually, I guess it was probably around 1949, Tolkien wrote a letter. It's one of the most amazing letters that he wrote. Uh, it was at the time he was trying to find a publisher both for The Lord of the Rings and his uncompleted work, The Silmarillion. And he wrote, Do not laugh, but once upon a time I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend, ranging from the large and cosmogonic to the level of romantic fairy story, which I could dedicate simply to, to England, to my country. I would draw some of the tales in fullness and leave many others placed in the scheme and sketched. The cycles would be linked to a majestic whole and yet leave scope for other minds and hands wielding paint and music and drama. Absurd. And absurd it is at a superficial context. Absurd. But it was actually what Tolkien was experiencing and thinking and understanding about himself at this particular point, around 1930. To give to his people, to England, a myth. Well, myths are old things, created by unenlightened people in distant ages. They are cultural artifacts of a people. The canon of myth is closed. The accepted corpus of work that we can call myth was created long ago, preserved, passed on, and now exists to be studied. One cannot simply open that canon, that accepted collection of received texts it's one o'clock at this belated time and enter into it a new myth. Tolkien could only give his people a myth if the canon of myth was essentially opened. Now, I use that word canon. It's a term used in religious circles principally to, to describe a collection of accepted valid texts. To open that collection of myth, myth itself had to be defined very differently. Not in historical terms of tenure, of how long it had existed and been passed on by people, nor by a dogmatic circumscription. But, and this is the important point, it had to be defined in terms of the manner of its reception. Myth is reborn authentically in tongue and time of different ages, in Tolkien's view. Men and women do sometimes step into the imaginal realm, cross the borderlands of fairy, and there, here, true stories. What they bring back, if recited in authentic voice, deserves entry into canon. It is authentic myth, and it is true. A bard who journeys into the land of fairy, the place of truth, can bring home a story worthy of being called authentic myth, and a story worthy of long retelling. The static historical mold of authenticity in this definition is shattered by active 
creative vision. Now, this is really a startling approach, a startling statement. A deconstruction of accepted wisdom, a breaking of canon, an opening of the creative voice to truth. Thus we come to Tolkien at the crossroads. For over two decades, he had struggled to understand himself and had come to a form of understanding of his creative experience. He had at times struggled to explain himself to others. But as far as revealing his creative experience, well, the man had stacks of manuscripts, most in various stages of incompletion in his office, and at this moment had published one slim volume of juvenile fiction called The Hobbit. He felt as if he could never quite complete anything. And he mentioned to his publisher at this point as he started as the new Hobbit story that he questioned whether he would ever be able to finish it. At about this time, Tolkien received a gift, a very important gift. And Tolkien's creative impulse did not only go to the vast and ancient panorama of the elves. Occasionally, imagination gave to him a much more personal thing. Around this time, 1938, he says in the years before the war, and here again I add in footnote, Tolkien never dated anything. And he never threw away a draft. So when one goes through Tolkien's material trying to figure out exactly when any particular thing was authored, it's difficult. And Tolkien's memory of when he did things in later years was not always very precise. But around this time, he says, he woke up one morning with a story fully formed in his head. He sat down and he wrote it out completely and thereafter never changed it. He called the story Leaf by Niggle. Tolkien, of course, was one to play with the meaning of words. Every elfin name has meanings. In Tolkien's vocabulary, a, a niggler was one who perpetually fussed with insignificant detail. And Tolkien knew himself to be a niggler. The story is not very long. In typescript, I think it runs uh, maybe 20 pages. It can be read in an hour. Let me read you just a bit from the beginning. Niggle was a painter, not a very successful one, partly because he had many other things to do. Most of these things he thought were a nuisance, but he did them fairly well when he could not get out of them, which in his opinion was far too often. He had a number of pictures on hand. Most of them were too large and ambitious for his skill. He was the sort of painter who can paint leaves better than trees. He used to spend a long time on a single leaf, trying to catch its shape, its sheen, the glistening of dewdrops dew on its edges. Yet he wanted to paint a whole tree with all of its leaves in the same style and all of them different. There was one picture in particular which bothered him. It had begun with a leaf caught in the wind and it became a tree. And the tree grew, sending out innumerable branches, thrusting out the most fantastic roots Strange birds came and settled on the twigs and had to be attended to. Then all around the tree and behind it, through the gaps in the leaves and the boughs, a country began to open out. And there were glimpses of a forest marching over the land and of mountains tipped with snow. Niggle lost interest in all of his other pictures, or else he took them and tacked them on to the edges of his great picture. Soon the canvas became so large 
that he had to get a ladder. And he ran up and down it, putting in a touch here, rubbing out a patch there. When people came to call, he seemed polite enough, though he fiddled a little with the pencils on his desk. He listened to what they had to say, but underneath, he was thinking all the time about his big campus. In the tall shed that had been built for it out in his garden, on a plot where once had grown potatoes. I think that's a beautiful summary, a gift given to Tolkien of exactly where he sat. He wasn't very kind to himself. And indeed, he had that canvas. It had started with a leaf and grown and grown to a great tree. There's a problem, though. Tolkien, a uh, nigger, had to take a journey. The coach was soon coming to take him away. And one day, as he worked out his painting, the coachman knocked and said it was time. In the story, it feels almost like death. He's driven off by the coachman. He comes before two voices who speak of him. And they feel that he needs some time in the workhouse to figure things out. <coughs> so it's on an interminable period, uncounted by Tolkien, people in years. He labors away at menial tasks, shoveling earth, fixing small things. And as he works, his niggling dissolves away. He becomes more focused, more happy, more joyous. Finally, the time comes when the merciful voice can be heard talking in the judgmental voice in the room next door. And then here is the conversation. And the merciful voice says that it's time for Nigel to move on to another room. He's taken to a train. The train rides off into the distance. He comes to a small country setting. He gets off the train and they're waiting for it. This is old bicycle. He rides the bicycle off across the hills. And there he discovered, before him stood the tree, his tree, finished. If you could say that a tree that was alive, its leaves opening, its branches growing and bending in the wind that Nigel had so often felt or guessed and had so often failed to catch. He gazed at the tree, and slowly he lifted his arms, and opening them wide. It's a gift, he said. He was referring to his art, and also to the result. But he was using the word quite literally. He went on looking at the tree. All the leaves he had ever labored at were there, as he had imagined them, rather than as he had made them. And there were others that had only budded in his mind, and many that might have budded if only he had had time. The birds were building in the tree, astonishing birds. How they sang. They were mating, hatching, growing, winging, flying away into the forest, even while he looked at them. For now he saw the forest was there too, and opening out on either side and marching away into the distance. The mountains were glimmering far away. Tolkien never left a psychological summary of his analysis of that uh, intrusion of imagination into his life. But I think in reading that small story, each of us can come away with a glimpse of what he was dealing with. The journey had come, the work was to be done, and there would be a result. It would live, it would grow. His tree, his tree of stories, would come to completion. This illustration is an illustration of the tree of stories that Tolkien repeatedly drew in various shapes and forms. The tree with roots deep in the unseen, flowering perpetually, bringing forth the creative imagination.
And so perhaps at this time Tolkien had come to understand himself and what he was to do. But there was another issue that he had never really taken in hand, and that was explaining his creative process to others. With the publication of The Hobbit, there had been some call for his time to talk about what he was doing. Of course, no one really knew at this point how small a tip of the iceberg the Hobbit story was. In early 1938, as he was with the Hobbits just leaving the Shire on his new Hobbit story and completely confused and unsure exactly what he was doing, he received an invitation to come speak to a small Oxford club on the subject of fairy stories. As the evening of the lecture arrived, he found that uh, he had procrastinated to the point that he had written nothing and really did not have a lecture to give. Tolkien's approach was, don't tell, show. And he took a little fairy story he had written at that time called Farmer Giles of Ham and read them the story. During that year, 1938 to 1939, the imaginative effort that he was putting into the Lord of the Rings, the new Hobbit story, began to click. By the end of the year, he had reached book three. He had a very good sense now of what he was about, of what the ring was, of who his characters were, and who these menacing black riders might be. At this time, in October of 1938, he received invitation from St. Andrews University in Scotland to come and give the Andrew Lang Memorial Lecture. He could give the lecture on any subject he wished. The subject he chose was on fairy stories. The time had come for him to make a statement. He labored with this lecture greatly. In the last couple of years, a very important book has been published for those interested in Tolkien studies. It's called On Fairy Stories. Two prominent Tolkien scholars have gone through the archive of Tolkien materials and have collected all of his draft work that he put in to authoring the small essay on fairy stories. It is an amazing and interesting book if Tolkien amazes and interests you. Because there we see how he struggled to bring form and term to his experience of the imagination of the realm of fairy. He worked on several drafts of this lecture, now collected and published together. His draft introduction went like this. The land of fairy story is wide and deep and high. In that land, a man may perhaps count himself fortunate to have wandered. But its very mystery and wealth make dumb the traveler who would report. The fairy gold too often turns to withered leaves when it is brought away. All that I can ask is that you, knowing all these things, will receive my withered leaves as a token at least that my hand once held a little of the gold. That my hand once held a little of the gold. To Tolkien, this was a very personal effort. He was trying to describe something that he had known, a venture to a place that he had experienced. In the final manuscript, those last words were humbly deleted by Tolkien. Tolkien's in interest and focus in this lecture, he had to make clear, were not in stories that had simply been received and labeled historically as fairy stories by common literary culture, but instead the creative experience of the land of fairy, a place he called by a transformed name with the spelling taken from Middle English and meaning that reach back to that more ancient age, fairy. And in his notes and in the lecture, he makes clear that most things that have been called fairy stories, in his estimate, were not. They had never touched fairy. True fairy stories derive from a veritable experience of this realm, of fairy. The definition of a fairy story, what it is, of what it should be, does not depend on any definition or historical account of elf or fairy, but upon the nature of fairy. The perilous realm itself 
and the air that blows in that country. I will not attempt to define that, nor to describe it directly. It cannot be done. Ferry cannot be caught in the net of words, for it is one of its qualities to be indescribable, though not imperceptible. Ferry itself may perhaps most nearly be translated by the word magic. And so, at his very beginning, Tolkien excludes one by one from consideration just about everything that has to that time been labeled a fairy story. Fairy has nothing to do with any definition or historical account of elf or fairy, but with the nature of fairy itself, the experience of entry into and the perception of the perilous realm, the land of fairy. If the story remains constrained or contained by the primary world, the common consensus reality, the common conscious perception of world, then it is not a fairy story. Fairy story touches a transcendence that cuts through that reality. Fairy story, a true fairy story, touches truth beyond the common consensus reality. And thus he goes on to say that a fairy story is not, well, it's not a moral tale. Like, uh, oh, the tale of Peter Rabbit. Little Peter Rabbit is told by his mama not to go to Farmer McGregor's garden or he'll end up as rabbit stew. But he does, gets in trouble, comes home, repents. A moral tale. A fairy story? No. It's a story about moral behavior. A fairy story isn't an allegory. An allegory is a symbolic representation used to portray or explain something about the life of the world, the primary world. This is one of the reasons, actually, that, that Tolkien disliked C.S. Lewis's Narnia tales, because he saw them really as allegories of a Christian belief system. They did not themselves break into the primary experience of myth. They allegorized the Christian story. Despite all of his efforts, Tolkien could never get Lewis across the boundaries, the borderlands of true fairy. It was a frustration to him, and in later life, by the time they were in their 50s, it led to the distancing of their, of their friendship. A fairy story is not a traveler's tale, like Gulliver's travels, a journey to strange corners of the primary world. It's not a time machine tale, and it's not a dream. Though Tolkien here states that many dream events touch the strange powers of fairy. If we couch the story itself as a dream experienced in this primary consensus reality, in the primary world, we have once again constrained it within the iron bounds. We've not let it break free, and it is not technically a fairy story. And it's not a figment or an illusion, a recounting of an hallucination or a delusion. Once again, these are pathological events within the primary world. And lastly, in Tolkien's opinion, fairy stories are not principally for children. In fact, they may not be for children at all. What is a fairy story? An experience derived from entry to the land of fairy. The realm of fairy is indescribable but it is not imperceptible, indescribable, but not imperceptible. Tolkien worked long and hard in his drafts trying to get this point across. What he had experienced imaginatively was truly indescribable, but it was a fact of his perception. He had perceived it. He had perceived the elfin tongues. He had perceived, received the gifts of the stories. How he initially saw them in the vision, that experience, the nature of that experience cannot be caught in the web of words. And he goes on to say it's a magical realm whose power and reality was approached in various ways by those whom history has called magicians. <laughs> 
Elsewhere he wrote, fairy can hardly be clearer defined than the hidden controlling power of nature, which the magician tried and pretended to use, but in which and by which fairies have their actual being. The use of the word magic was difficult for Tolkien, and he yet worked with this in his drafts long and hard in various ways. Difficult due to the modern assumptions that define the word magic. Once upon a time, and not so long ago, humankind accepted as part of natural reality unseen powers and forces and beings. Mog means great. Magic, once upon a time, was the great work, the magical art. It was the art of invoking, evoking, and perhaps controlling the unseen forces, nonetheless natural, but the unseen forces of life. Magic came in a goetic form, a form oriented towards manipulating these forces to one's own personal gain. But there was also a theurgic form, a form of invoking high spiritual powers to communication, to learning, to knowledge. Tolkien, of course, couldn't mess with any of this. The problem was that in most people's mind, magic was, well, superstition, false, or perhaps dark. Nonetheless, fairy carried the subtle savor of magic. And here again, remember, Tolkien is speaking from his own experience. If fairy is a realm, a place, or state of perception, an alternative world, well then, how does one find it? Where is it? Where are its boundaries? And again, in his notes, he works with this concept. He starts paragraph after paragraph after paragraph with the words, it's difficult to define the boundaries of fairy and then goes on with a paragraph or two trying to define them, slashes it out, and starts again. It is difficult to define the boundaries of that realm as they lie today. They have advanced and receded bewilderingly in the past. There within fairy, all things are either strange or else seen in a strange light, which reveals them, even when their shape is unchanged as things ominous and significant. In that land, a tree is a tree, and its roots may run throughout the earth, and its fall affect the stars. It is enchanted. What does that mean? It means, I think, that when we cross the borders of fairy, we believe that the scientific, measurable facts and laws of relationship of things and events are only one aspect of the world. There is a world where things are not so, where will, imagination, and desire are directly effective. Where therefore good and evil are at once arrayed in strange symbolic forms and nakedly revealed with startling suddenness and clarity. Where beauty in all aspects majestic and delicate, is natural, ready to hand of those that wish it, like the free water of an unfailing spring. When we cross the borders of fairy, we believe that the scientific, measurable facts and laws of relationship of things and events are only one aspect of the world. There is a world where things are not so, where will, imagination, and desire are directly effective. So what sort of experience is he talking about here? It's really a fracturing of common consciousness into a quite different realm. Is it hallucination? No. It's not a hallucination. An illusion? No. Is it a dream from which we awaken? No. And do many of us go there? Best I can tell, no. Does that mean that Tolkien did not? No. He knew what he was talking about. It's a strange place, 
that borderland, a distant, difficult land. Few are those who reach it, but once in a generation, once in a time, a woman, a man might, and they might bring back evidence. They might bring back in their palm a little fairy gold. Tolkien explained that fairy was a realm of power. Fantasy was the rational activity by which one entered the realm of fairy. So fairy is a state of consciousness, we might say, a place of perceptive reality. And the way we get there is through a rational activity, which he called fantasy. And fantasy comes from the Greek word, from the Greek word which means to show in light. We think of fantasy as a fiction, but no, it's a showing forth, a perception. To show at the eye of the mind. But then again, of course, it is not easy to find that road. Indeed, not many people do find it. He goes on to say, fantasy, of course, starts out with an advantage, arresting strangeness. But that advantage has turned against it and has contributed to its disrepute. Many people dislike being arrested. They dislike any meddling with the primary world or such small glimpses of it as are familiar to them. They therefore stupidly and even maliciously confound fantasy and dreaming, in which there is no art, and with mental disorders, mental disorders, in which there is not even control, with delusion and hallucination. Mental disorders, delusion, hallucination, these are the things that have been used to describe an experience that Tolkien is rationally pursuing. Am I giving you a hint of how unusual this man's experience is? I don't know if this is coming across. As you go through this material, as you really read what he is saying, it's quite clear that imagination to him was a very unusual experience. And he continues, that the air or malice engendered by disquiet and consequent dislike is not the only cause for confusion about this realm of fairy. Fantasy, and here one might read instead the word imagination, has also an essential drawback. It is very difficult to achieve. I don't know if any of you have danced to that borderland in your own lives. <clears throat> there was a great Swiss psychologist by the name of Carl Gustav Jung who advocated a practice called active imagination, a process of seeking just this sort of creative activity where one allowed imagination to be real and autonomous, to approach it rationally and in awakeness. It's easy to compare, if one knows much about Jung's own life, his experience with Tolkien's, and I may approach that in the coming lecture. How does one approach this, this realm? I think I've danced to those margins on a few occasions. I remember one time when my children were small, reading them bedtime stories, having no particular story to tell, sitting down in the darkened room and beginning a tale of a woodcutter, seeking something in an ancient forest and heading down the trail in his quest. I don't know where the idea came from. It was nighttime, I was tired, they were tired, and we started. They fell asleep. I became more and more awake. I realized that there was something down that road awaiting. I went down to my office and I continued writing throughout the night. And believe me, there was something waiting unexpected, unchosen, and certainly not of my own creation or will. And this story has become precious to me, a precious fragment, and indeed unforgettable, because those were the last words that were spoken to me in that fantasy. <laughs> 
do not forget. I have a sense through that that leads me further down the road in my attempt to know what Tolkien was doing. And I think many of us here may have our own glimmerings of what it was. What is fairy? He writes in his drafts. It reposes for us now in a view that the normal world, tangible, visible, audible, is only an appearance. What is this fairy? It reposes for us now in a view that the normal world, tangible, visible, audio, audible, is only an appearance. Behind it is a reservoir of power which is manifest in these forms. If we can drive a well down to this reservoir, we shall tap a power that can not only change the visible form of things already existent, but sprout up with a boundless wealth forms of things never before known, potential but unrealized. And then, quite late in life, he wrote another short tale that I'll talk about next time called Smith of Woten Major. And in his own analysis of that story, he wrote, Fairy represents at its weakest a breaking out, at least in mind, from the iron ring of the familiar. Still more from the adamantine ring of belief that it, the familiar, is known, possessed, controlled, and so ultimately all that is worth being considered. A constant awareness of a world beyond these rings. Fairy might be said indeed to represent imagination without definition because taking in all the definitions of the word, aesthetic, exploratory, receptive, artistic, inventive, dynamic, sub-creative. This compound, an awareness of a limitless world outside our domestic parish, a love in Ruth and admiration, Ruth means compassion in Old Middle English, a love in Ruth and admiration for the things in it, and a desire for wonder, marvel, both perceived and conceived. This fairy is necessary for health and complete functioning of the human, as is sunlight for physical life. This fairy is necessary for health and complete functioning of the human, as is sunlight and physical life. A breaking out from the iron ring of the familiar. Still more from the adamantine ring of belief that the familiar is all that is known, possessed, and controlled. And so ultimately, all that is worth being considered. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to announce to you tonight that you are being held prisoner collectively, by an iron ring and an adamantine ring. Oh, you may think you're not. You are, unfortunately, all of you, prisoners. I have heard tale that somebody is planning a revolt against that ring. He claims that there is more than Lord Morgoth's iron crown. Now, the one planning this revolt, I hear, is one actually who himself cut a jewel once upon a time from that iron crown. In form, Tolkien is making those sorts of declarations to us. We are of the assumption that our quotidian reality, our common reality, is the only reality. And that is a fact that imprisons us.
that binds us with a nasty, nasty ring to servitude, to slavedom. And indeed, from ever really finding our potential, our glory, our God-given gift and destiny. There is something more. When we read the Lord of the Rings, we sense a depth, a truth, a reality. Where does it come from? It comes from the vision of a man who knew depth, who knew truth, who knew the reality of something more than the common. And so these two statements in hand, John Ronald Rule Tolkien began the long journey. In 1939, he made his explanation of his understanding of his experience. He had understood. He had made effort at public expression. Now what remained to him? To reveal. To reveal the product of that creative journey. Reveal. And so he did over the next decade in a long, struggling path. Today, we have his revelation in his writings. And so next week, we will attempt to examine Tolkien's experience in the focus of the history of Western creative imagination. Where does he stand? Where does his experience stand in comparison, in relation to some other creative voices? And although I have repeatedly said that Tolkien's creative enterprise had very few analogs in modern history, I did not say it had none. And only really by taking that experience and setting it side by side with a few other such visions can we truly come to appreciate the core of the imaginative life of John Ronald Rule Tolkien. So thank you very much.